Welcome to the Business Speak Podcast, where we take everything you need to know about being successful in business and make it easy to understand. Whether you're a longtime business owner, newer to this entrepreneur stuff, or hoping to run your own company in the future, you've come to the right place. Featuring your host, professional accountant and business guru, Mr. Chill. So relax and have some fun with us as we journey through business speak, the language of business simplified. Well, hello, welcome everybody to the business speak podcast. Um, I'm your host, uh, Mr. Chill. Uh, and uh, I'm excited to welcome you to our second episode. Uh, this is our first one where we get a uh, have a guest co-host with us today, and uh, I think I've got a pretty special guy with me today. Uh, the topic of our episode today is to business or not to business. That is the question. And so when I was thinking about who might make a really great co-host with me here, uh, I was trying to figure out a profession that might work a lot with business owners, particularly those who are starting out uh, or even just thinking about starting out. And one of the professions that came to mind was a business lawyer. Now, I'm curious to see what my co-host thinks today, but sometimes like accountants, business lawyers get a, a rap for being kind of boring, but I think our, my guest host today is anything but. So I'm excited, to, I'm excited for you to meet him and to have a conversation today about the do's and don'ts and kind of just things to keep in mind when you're thinking about starting a business or perhaps if you already have some things that you may want to revisit. So joining me here today, I have Evan Clark. Uh, Evan is a lawyer. Uh, I thought I knew how to pronounce the name of his company, but now I'm second guessing <laughs> myself. It's Kahane Law Office. Kahane Law Office. Because it reminds me of a Hawaiian name, but I don't think that's how you pronounce it. Lots so. of people call it Kahane, but it's, uh, it's, it's actually... Um, a trade name that I license. I, I'm associated with a firm down in Calgary. We're separate, but we use the same name. And the firm down in Calgary is headed by Jeff Kahane. So he that's how he pronounces his name, so that's how we say it. But you're not alone. Lots of people uh, say, is it, is it Kahane? And <laughs> so it's fine. Very good. Um, actually, so I was telling you, I, I think Evan is one of the business lawyers who's probably quite more entertaining than most one of the first memories I have of meeting Evan was actually at a like a couple's get together game night, and hmm. he had some of the most amazing, creative, fun answers to the game that we were playing. I don't even remember what the game was. I just remember laughing a lot. Hmm. So I think you're gonna have some fun here today. Now, Evan, I've got a, a bio here that's done up on your website um, from Kahane Law, and uh, I'll read it, and then you can tell me what you want to <laughs> embellish. Sure. Tell me what you want to expand on. So as Evan grew up in Nanaimo, BC on Vancouver Island, where he worked in his father's financial planning business before starting his own tile installation company in 2006. After the financial crash of 2008, he left the island to get a bachelor's degree in Spanish and Hispanic studies and linguistics at the University of British Columbia. Upon graduating in 2014, he moved to Edmonton, where he earned his Juris Doctor from the University of Alberta. An active entrepreneur himself, Evan enjoys assisting business owners overcoming the issues they face, whether they be the issues associated with just starting out or the pains that come from success and growth. Evan's also a member of the Canadian Armed Forces Primary Reserve. He has taught on numerous military courses, received various awards, including the Operation Impact Command Team coin. I'd be curious for you to explain to me more about that. While serving a seventh month tour in a seven month tour in Kuwait. In 2020, he received an award for the most outstanding NCO in his regiment. Evan is the father of five children. When he's not with them or at the office, you can find him in the basement recording studio or playing soccer or ice hockey. Now that's where the stuff I took from your uh, bio on your website ended, mm -hmm. but it makes me think of a couple other things like a, and I don't know if you want to talk about it in this podcast or not, but you have a long time project you've been working on that maybe is appropriate for the Christmas season. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So I, I make music under, I changed to a pseudonym once I uh, became a lawyer. I didn't want people like looking up 
my name and then finding a bunch of music stuff because, um, you know, I do that for fun. It's not my profession. So um, it's a different level of quality, I think, than than what I want to uh, <laughs> convey as a lawyer. But so my pseudonym that I use is Hazlet. And um, yeah, I've been working on this project uh, where I do Handel's Messiah, but with guitars doing all the orchestral parts. Um, and then and guitars that are distorted so it's kind of like a you know rock sound but the style of the playing generally speaking and the style of the voices is still um, classical in style I'm not like a classically trained musician or anything like that so I don't want to sound dumb if somebody's listening that is a classically trained <laughs> musician but I do know that, that Handel's Messiah is from the Baroque period and I don't know that the musical stylings and, and the, the singing stylings are Baroque, but uh, I just do my best to kind of keep it um, as opposed to, I guess, classical in nature as opposed to, you know, uh, hard rock style singing. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to kind of, um, yeah, keep the, the feel the same as much as possible. So. Yeah, I've been doing that for a long time. I've released part one. Messiah's, Messiah has three parts, and it's over, um, I think it's like 52 songs. Some of those are really short. Others are longer. Um, but I've done part one. Part one is released. I released it last year, so you can go to Spotify or wherever and, and hear it. And uh, I'm in the middle of recording. I decided I'm going to do part two and part three, and I'll, I'll release kind of both of them when I'm finished. But... It's taken a long time, so I don't know. I don't know when I'm going to release the next two parts, but it took me quite a few years to get the first part done. I started working on it in 2006, and I released it last year, to, so 2022. So I don't think. I hope it doesn't take <laughs> me that long to re release parts two and parts three, but um, yeah, we'll see. It's a little passion project of mine. I was gonna say, it's you're in it that long, and you're still wanting to finish. It's definitely going to be a labor of love. Yeah, for sure. Um, anything you want to embellish on about this? podcast or about your bio or expand on i know one thing you wanted to mention that i want to do a shout out for and i'll let you uh, mention as much of that as you want to is you actually do your own podcast yes uh, legal uh, advice related podcast tell us about that it's called access to justice and you can find it at a2jpodcast.com i think i think that's it, it might be dot ca but i think it's dot com uh and I mean, if you just search access to access to justice podcast on the internet, you'll find it. Um, yeah, we've been doing it for a few years and it's me, uh, Heather Mallark, who's a, a family law lawyer and um, Kim McDonald from Raymond James. Well, sorry, Kim is a special co-host. She, she is a special guest co-host. She's not one of the co-hosts because she's not allowed to be. Um, by the regulators but uh the three of us are on almost every episode and we have guests in and it started off just focusing on legal stuff but we kind of expanded um the idea is our whole goal is to kind of lower the barrier of entry to specialized knowledge and so we want people to come on and share you know their specialized knowledge kind of dumb it down for the average person so that you know just make it easier for people um Started with law because family law is a real is a it, it's a real problem. Uh, the buzzword is access to justice. That's why we named our podcast "Access to Justice." And 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 what that's about is people face these legal issues, especially in family law, where um, it's difficult for them to navigate those issues because it's expensive. And part of the problem with family law is, like with business, presumably there's some revenue somewhere, and there's like the business is generating money. In family law, you have one household and now you're dividing it into two, but the income isn't changing. And so now the incomes, whether it's one stream or two, that was supporting one household now have to support two households. Yeah. And on top of that, they have legal fees and both of them have legal fees. And uh, that's quite expensive. And so... And you can imagine if it's a if it's a family where their their gross annual income is like sixty thousand dollars a year, like how are you supposed to survive on that and be paying legal fees on top of that? Yeah. So it's a real problem in family law. And so our approach to it was just to try and you know 
get information out there, like let people know um, what are the issues, how to deal with them, what your options are for proceeding with a divorce or um, you know separation if you're in that kind of a situation. It's a super high stress situation. So we're just trying to get information out there as much good information as we can. And then we just expanded from there. We've had uh, business lawyers on there. We've had uh, employment lawyers. We've had uh, all kinds of different lawyers, but we've also had uh, a couple of certified business valuators. Um, and we've had different financial planners, mortgage brokers. Um, yeah, all kinds. If you go to the website, you can see that we, we've divided them, I think, into a couple different. Op- I think there's some like in the psychology stream, some in the financial stream, some in the legal stream are kind of the main streams of different guests that we've had, different categories. So I think on the website, you can go and um, browse whatever uh, stream you think might you might be interested in. Wonderful. And obviously, that's kind of another passion project for you, trying to help people who yeah. maybe need help and perhaps yeah. don't know how to afford it otherwise. Well, I, I really strongly believe, and this is tied to what we're talking, what our topic is today. I strongly believe that if you, the best philosophy when you're um, doing business is to do the right thing. I think, I think, in business. In the end, you'll always be rewarded ultimately by doing the right thing, and I and I think yeah. financially you'll be rewarded ultimately by doing the right thing, making the right choices. And so, um, while there is no revenue being generated from our podcast at all, and in fact, we do a ter- terrible job marketing it, <laughs> uh, so not not enough people know about it. And even though it's an amazing resource that we really hope we really want people to know about, um, you know, our hope is just that you know people will hear it and and it'll improve their lives. And my belief is that by being involved in a project like that, I'm giving back and that uh, I'll see, ultimately somehow I'll see benefits from that. If nothing else, it's like it, it, it's your attitude of um, abundance mentality, mentality yeah. right? Like Stephen R. Covey talks about. Yeah. And I think that's the right mentality to take with business. Yeah. And we might actually dive into that concept here uh, today if we get a chance. Two other things about your bio stand out to me. One is, I think it's always helpful. I know like when I was in university, you had some teachers that all they had done their entire careers teach. <laughs> and it was okay. Some were good, some were not as good. Depending on the topic, yeah. And then you had some teachers who were what they called sessional instructors often. And so mm-hmm. their day job, they were out doing what they were teaching you. And then they were teaching it to you in their spare time or in their day off or in the evenings or whatever. And so you felt like you got a lot more like real world practical application to what they were teaching. And so I, and it doesn't look like it lasted too long, but you ran a business several years ago, a tiling business it looks mm-hmm. like, and then you are in some form running your own law firm now. I know you partner with someone, but so not only do you talk about business law and teach people business law, but you are a business owner, you are an entrepreneur. Yeah. So I think that it's going to add some valuable insight into your perspective in this. Yeah, absolutely. Like I, I, I do run my own firm. I'm not in a partnership. I have uh, the like Jeff Kahane, who's a great guy. Our arrangement is is a business arrangement, but he's not my boss. He would tell you he's like he. I do my thing. I pay, and and our arrangement is a licensing arrangement. But we're collaborative, like wherever it makes sense. We we want to, um, like, we started it with the idea of like, is there a mutually beneficial arrangement here that that will work for both of us? And it so far it's been really good. But the nature of the relationship is, I use the name. I'm on the website, but otherwise I'm on my own, innovating, doing my own thing. We do things very differently than they do down there. Fair enough. Um, especially in family law, uh, I do family law as well as, um, you know corporate law or business law and wills and estates. Those are the main areas that I practice. And um, I have another lawyer that works with me there named Russ Schmidt, and he only does family. And we've developed an innovative approach. Uh, We do, for family law, we do a subscription fee. So instead of doing by the hour, which most people do, or set fee plus hourly, which is what I was doing before, which is also quite innovative because I was doing set fee for things that nobody else is doing set fee for. I was still doing too much hourly and I hate the billable hour. I Mm -hmm. think it's a terrible, terrible model. Mm -hmm. And so we want to decouple our revenue from time 
in a way that um, is a win for the client as well as for us. And we think subscription is the way to do that. Um, so anyways, we do that for family law and that's like, Canadian Law in Calgary doesn't, like they know about it because I, <laughs> you know, I, I talked a lot with Jeff about it because it's his brand that I'm building and that I'm doing these things under. So um, for sure I talked, and he's, very, he's a lot more experienced than me in, in, in running a legal business. Um, so I, you know, we talk about it and I showed him what I was doing and got his feedback and stuff. But ultimately it's, uh, you know, their family law department is not interested in <laughs> the risks associated with changing the billing model completely. <laughs> Fair enough. Very good. And the other part of the, the bio of yours that, um, and maybe you don't want to talk about it, but, um, I think it, um, commands a lot of gratitude and respect is your, uh, military service. Anything you want to expand upon that? I don't mind talking about it. Um, yeah, I, my my military career is is like winding down. Really, I don't do too much now um, because I'm so busy busy with my my business. But it's a career that has served me very well over the years. I started it as I started university. That's when I I swore in to the forces in 2009, and I started university that fall. And um, it's been great. It was a great job to have while I was a student, usually full-time employment during the summer and good employment during the school year, making better money than I would have been working at McDonald's or something <laughs> and um, making great, strong relationships with uh, good people. I, you know, I've met lots of good friends through my service in the military. That's one of the things that keeps people around is the sense of community that you get in the military. And um, the highlight for me definitely was serving in Kuwait in 2019. That was a great experience. I'm lucky to have been able to have, and and uh, you know that my family enabled me to to go and do. That was really tough for them. Yeah, it would have been really hard, I think. Yeah, seven months with dad gone, um, my for my wife or husband gone. That was really tough, but um, yeah. So it it's something that is is an important part of who I am, and. Um, I really value my service, and I've learned a lot from my from my service in the military. And um, but I don't know how much longer I'll be staying in. We'll, we'll see. It's it's tough because y you're in the military, you want to contribute, and if you stop being able to contribute in a meaningful way because you just don't have the time, mm -hmm. then you know you don't want to just be dead weight and stick around. You want to at some point you have to leave. So I don't know. I don't know how much longer I'll be in, but. Uh, I'm still in it for now, and I'm still enjoying it. Well, that's great. Thank you for your service. I, I think that's an amazing thing that you've been able to do. Now, Evan, before we dive into our topic today, um, anything else that you think uh, our listeners would benefit from knowing about you? Hmm. I know that's a pretty broad question. Well, I, I would answer it just in respect to what we're going to be talking about, about business. And, um, like, so my first exposure really to working in a business was working my dad's financial planning business in Nanaimo and working with a, a couple of my brothers. And there I got, um, I basically received a pretty good education about business. And part of the reason it's such a good education is because the business failed. It like, it, it turned out, my dad's a great man. And he, um, he, there was a trusted, he had a trusted colleague um, who introduced him to this great investment opportunity for his clients. That he was, and so he started. My dad was a great salesman, and he started going after it hard. And it was great for quite a while, for a couple of years at least. It was it was doing it was great, but it was a uh, it turned out to be a Ponzi scheme. Oh no! And so while my dad wasn't a perpetrator of the scheme, uh, and he wasn't benefiting from the scheme, like he wasn't the guy running the Ponzi scheme, he was he was financing the Ponzi scheme by getting clients money and so that all came to an end a very ugly end and that was tough and I didn't even like I kind of fell into it by default because I didn't have anything else to do I didn't know what I was going to do with my life and so I was like oh, I'll work there 
And when things got tough, it's like, what am I doing here? I don't even want to be here. <laughs> but um, my brothers had me, you know, reading Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, mm-hmm. which, you know, I talked about. We share a love for that book. Yeah. I think it's a very, very powerful book. And um, uh, E-Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber. It's another classic. Yeah. And, and that opened my mind to the concept of, like, you know, Michael Gerber is all about um, – creating a franchise model, whether or not you franchise, but like thinking about your business the way that Ray Kroc thought about McDonald's. Yes. And so that got me thinking about business in that way. And um, Seven Habits got me thinking about, you know, how to plan, how to be proactive, you know, and, and how to... So those two together were a powerful combination for me. As I jumped the sinking ship of my dad's financial planning business uh, that went down in disgrace... Um, I started a tiling business with my brother-in-law. Um, we were best friends, and he started dating my sister, and and that's how he became my brother-in-law. But we were we were friends first, and I I was just like I didn't know what to do. Um, and he was like, "Well, I'm tiling. Maybe we should start a tiling business." And so we started a tiling business, and I took the things that I had been learning in books and stuff at my my dad's business, and um, he and I embarked on this journey together. I didn't know anything about tiling. I'd never done it before ever in my life. <laughs> um, but I'm good with my hands. And so I was a quick study and, and I learned how to do that because, you know, often in a business you start your, your, the technician, you're everything. Mm-hmm. And so I started off in, a, you know, as an, an apprentice role basically and um, taught him everything I knew which wasn't a lot, but everything, but more than he knew, uh, and and the mindset about business that I'd learned from those books, and we tried to implement it, and and it was going pretty well. But um, that was another great learning experience because it failed ultimately as well. And while it was like an external factor you couldn't plan for, like the mortgage crash, that crisis was a pretty significant financial crisis across the world, and especially yes. in North America. Yes. Um, and Nanaimo is a very, if you're not familiar with Nanaimo, it's a very, um, it's a very closed economy. It's not, um, like there's an, there's water between Nanaimo and Vancouver, and there's a mountain between Nanaimo and Victoria. Victoria is like 300,000 people. Vancouver's 2.5 million. Nanaimo at the time was like 100,000 people. <laughs> And that was kind of it. Like, and so things are tough economically there at the best of times. And so when the crash happened, it was literally like we, we had a multi, like we had a bid in on a job that was over $100,000, which was really big for us. We were, we were just poised to grow. We had developed this relationship with this commercial builder and we were now bidding on a serious job. And we were, I think we actually got the bid, but they stopped construction. They'd already had the foundations board. And then they stopped and walked away from it. So that's that was the state of affairs in Nanaimo, Vancouver Island in 2008. Um, but that that was great because it that was like um, also like a business school because I got to I got a little bit further and I got to build with my friend this business and um, we were doing lots of good things and uh, you know and then we saw we saw failure, which has really helped in my newest business, but I took a long hiatus after that. It was exhausting. (laughs) I don't know if you've ever had a business fail, but it is one of the most exhausted feelings I've ever had in my life. I just was exhausted afterwards. I couldn't think about what I was going to do next. Um, I I was, you know, it was like I had three children at the time. I was uh, 20, 27, 28, and didn't have any like marketable skills that I could, you know, to, to get another job because I had a bunch of small business experience and nobody cares <laughs> about small business experience, especially small businesses that failed. They don't see value in that. <laughs> they don't see value in that. Right? I remember I applied to a um, manager position for 7-Eleven and um, I interviewed, I thought it went well, but they hired somebody who had a bachelor's degree instead. So, but I, bef- before they actually told me the result, I'd already decided I wasn't going to work at 7-Eleven, but that's kind of the, I was looking for anything. That's why I ended up joining the forces and going to university. I didn't want to ever find myself in the position, in that position ever again. So I got as many irons in the fire kind of as I could. And it, and 
both of those have worked out very well for me, luckily. Um, the military has provided great opportunities and, and, and gainful employment over the years and helped a little bit with my schooling. And then schooling led me to law school, which led me to eventually opening my own firm. Wow. So that was kind of a long answer to your question. Is <laughs> there anything else people should know about you? But um, to business or not to business, for me, sometimes the answer was, yeah, let's do it. And other times the answer was, I can't even think about taking that emotional journey again. What has it been like for you? Have you always wanted to be an entrepreneur and start your own business? <laughs> I used to call myself only because I heard the term before, uh, I think it was an intrapreneur, and maybe I'm using that term wrong. But basically, it was I was comfortable helping someone else run their business. I didn't have the gutsy whatever I needed to kind of go off and take a risk of running my own. I, maybe I'm using the word wrong, but I have always assumed and felt very risk averse. And to me, starting a business is all filled with a whole lot of unknowns and a whole lot of risk and I was not super excited to take on any of it so I don't think I've wanted to be in business most of my life I was quite comfortable to have someone else take on that risk um, I had a bit of an experience when I was working for somebody else that kind of opened my eyes to this concept for the first time thinking that it might be doable um, I was going to share this later but I guess I could just share it now I uh I was a controller for a company uh, in Alberta and I was loving my job. I was trying to get really good at my job and I thought, well, one of the things that I could do to get better at my job is go attend a conference designed to help controllers be better at their job. So I went to this conference in Banff, Alberta. It was a gorgeous setting. I'm there for a week. Everyone else at this conference is also in a controllership type role or had seen like financial role in a company usually one that they're not running, uh, like not owning. And at one point towards the end of the conference, uh, we were told that we were gonna be granted a, uh, a one hour, free one hour session uh, with one of the business slash life coaches that was helping to like, administer the, the conference. And we were given a day or so's notice so that we could kind of figure out what questions, how we wanted to use that time the best. And I was dreading it. Like on the one hand, I thought, okay, this is cool because I'm getting a free one hour session. But at the same time, I was dreading it because I wasn't sure I'd be able to, like I'd know what to ask. And if I'm really honest, looking back now, I was, I think I knew what I wanted to ask, but I was scared to ask it. Mm. The question I wanted to ask uh, that I was terrified of, and eventually that's all I said when I went in. I was like, I only have one question for you. I'm scared to ask it, but that's all I got. And this was the question I asked this lady. And I basically said, I make a six-figure salary right now. I've got a family, like my wife and I, we've got six kids, and I'm the only income earner in my family, and we've got a mortgage, and we've got vehicle payments, and all this life. It doesn't ever feel like a responsible thing for me to abandon all that and start my own practice. I had kind of got an idea that maybe that's what I felt prompted or wanted to do, but I, I didn't feel like it was a responsible thing to do, so I was just sort of dismissed it. And the lady said something to me that I have always remembered. Um, and I might be remembering it slightly differently, but it's something like this. It's a gist of what she said that has kind of been a crux for me in starting a business of my own, which is, she's like, I know, Corey, you're scared. I know it doesn't seem responsible, and I can't really take that away. But she said, at some point, the frustration of not moving ahead with this goal, with this dream of running your own business, it's going to outweigh the fear of what might happen if you do. And she said, when that happens, when you hit that point, you'll know you're ready. And so that has stuck with me all of these years, trying to figure out what point I would be ready, what point that frustration of not doing something would outweigh my fears that might happen if I did something. Well, where did the dream come from? Because she, she, she mentioned this dream. So even at the time you went to that controller's um, seminar thing, were you already kind of thinking in your mind you might like to run your own business? Yeah, and I guess part of it was in in the job I was in. Even though I loved it, I I only got to work with one like one company, 
and it was okay, uh, and the people were great, but the challenge is, for me is, I wanted to be able to help more people than that. Um, so I was able to influence one key set of people, and I thought, well, that was fun, especially when they actually listened to any counsel or advice or guidance they supposedly hired me to give them. What if we could multiply that, and what if we could help a lot more people? Mm. So that was sort of the idea behind it initially was, if I open my own practice, then not only can I do this kind of help for one company, I could do this kind of help for many companies. Mm. So that was kind of the, the motivation behind it. I never really thought I'd become an accountant. I actually became an accountant sort of contradictory to my father's advice. <laughs> <laughs> because when I told him what I thought I was going to go into, he's like, well, I don't know much about accounting, but my sister's an accountant and she hates her life. <laughs> <laughs> so if you become an accountant, don't come back to me and tell me that you don't like it because I warned you. So I went into it despite my father's cautions. Um, didn't really know what accountants did. I just knew that I, I wanted to help people. And I felt like there was an avenue here that I could really help. And for most of the time I've been running this practice of mine, I've been focusing on the small business owner, the mom and pop shop common thing that we talk about. Mm -hmm. And I like helping big businesses, but I, it's even more passion for me to help small businesses. So that's kind of my story. Uh, you asked the question, if I ever had a business fail, um, not in reality. Um, I've done assignments over the years where we did mock businesses, and I think all of them failed. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that didn't boost my confidence any. Uh, but no, I've never had a real-life business fail. I've been, well, I'd say I've been fortunate, but you, you put a great spin on things, and you referenced Dr. Covey's work too, but... Yeah, so sometimes I think we don't do things because we're afraid to fail, like that's a horrible sign or that that's like an end-all be-all. And if we can look at it a different way, failure can be one of our greatest teachers, even though it's scary. Oh, for sure. Like that's, there's no question in my mind, like the, the lessons that I've learned from my failures are way more ingrained in me than lessons I learned otherwise. And part of it's because of the pain of failing. It hurts so much that you're like, you don't want to experience that again. So you're like, well, not, that's, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> right? Which is, you know, everyone can, I think everyone can identify with that because we all fail in other aspects of our life. So for business, it's like, you know, yeah, you, when you learn a, a lesson the hard way in business, you, you don't forget it. But I mean, you know, you don't have to fail. It'd be great if you don't have a business that fails and you just have success. Well, I heard a I heard an interesting approach to this once. Uh, you have like what some people call serial entrepreneurs, people mm -hmm. that start multiple, multiple businesses. And sometimes you'll find serial entrepreneurs that start successful business after successful business after successful business. But sometimes you'll find serial entrepreneurs that start one big business, fails horribly. All right, we'll start another one. That may not work. I'll start another one. And like, well, why would you keep doing that if you keep failing? And after enough big failures, then you're more likely to hit a big success. Yeah, well, and you've, even if you look at the, and I'm not an expert in this, but the venture capital capital world, right? They're, they're looking for a small percentage of successes because the small percentage of successes will be successful enough to pay for all the failures, right? So that kind of mentality for the serial entrepreneur as well. It's like, they don't need everyone to be success. Um, you just need one and yeah. then you're good. And then, yeah. So do you think it'd be helpful for us since we've titled this episode to business or not to business, would it be helpful to sort of define or at least get a agreeable definition of what business is? Like I could give you what a, a government sure. tax entity might say, but <laughs> what, maybe let's not go down that route for a minute. What, what would you define a business as? Or, and maybe not like a textbook definition, but just in conversational layman's terms. Yeah. Well, I, listening, what does that mean to you? I saw your textbook definition um, that you sent, like as I, you know, thank you for sending me your thoughts beforehand. It was helpful. Uh, but yeah, so um, business. How would I define business? Um, I, I don't, I didn't, you know, I've never really thought about it. Um, you know, I guess just like, um, you know, selling selling something to somebody in a very simple way. That's kind of, you know. I mean, I like, you know the, you know the movie Robots? 
Yes. Yeah, we have kids the same ages. Yes. So robots, right? You have uh, Mr. Big, what's his name? Mr. Bigwell. Mr. Bigwell, right? And he says, find a need, fill a need. And I think that's a really good description of business too, right? Is like, I want to find a need, a problem, and I want to solve that problem and monetize that solution. Yeah, actually, that's that's really good. Um, you said you saw the textbook definition I was looking at before. I don't really want to read that. The one that's coming to mind mostly because it has to do with what I do all the time in my professional life as an accountant is what can a revenue agency would define a business as. And very simply, they would just say, it's the intent of making a profit. <laughs> I think that intent word's crucial because obviously a lot of businesses don't every year or possibly ever, but the goal is to make a profit. I, I love the CRA. Yeah. The problem I have with that definition is I think there's a lot better reasons to go into business than just to make a profit. Now, yeah. obviously you got to put food on the table. You got to pay your employees. If you hire any, you got to like put, keep the lights on. So you have to like, you can't just give everything away for free. There's value in that, but, um, it's got to be bigger. Got to be bigger than that. I, I agree. But um, if you're going to be altruistic, don't go public. Because once you go public, there's a, one, of the, one of the cases that I learned in law school is about um, Ford. Ford went public and uh, one of the big shareholders was, were the Dodge brothers. <laughs> so Ford, Irony. Henry Ford was, was pretty altruistic and he had this plan I can't remember all the details, you, you know, your listeners can, can look it up, but he had this plan to, and this idea to get, you know, so that everyone could afford, afford. Um, and the, the Dodge brothers were among the, the shareholders that rejected it and they sued, uh, they sued Ford because um, the, the ratio of that case is that a corporation is there to serve its shareholders by generating profit, by being profitable. And Ford's plan was not maximizing profits, right? It was uh, altruistic. Profit was secondary. It wasn't the primary goal. So um, as long as you are uh, not public, I think you're probably okay. Uh, you know, but once you get a bunch of other shareholders, even if you're not public, I suppose, you get a bunch of other shareholders in there, um, if you're too altruistic, it, you're sacrificing profits for an altruistic purpose. If the other shareholders aren't on board, you could be uh, you could be at risk. It's true. That's true. I don't know who's all going to listen to this podcast, but I think the large majority of people that uh, we're targeting here, are people that are the smaller businesses that can I can make those key decisions without having to really rely on a lot of other people kind of telling them what to do. Hmm. I told you I wasn't going to read the textbook definition of <laughs> um, a business, but I do want to read some of the synonyms because some of these, I think, actually speak to me a little bit. Um, here's a few of the ones that I found. Pursuit, specialty, vocation, and this is probably my personal favorite, calling. I mean, in a religious sense, you can have callings. In a like a life sense, you can have callings. Maybe uh, if you're running a business because you feel that's what you've been called to do by a higher power or whatever you may believe in that regard, um, that to me really speaks to me. Because when I when when I started my business, that was kind of my motivation. I think is it wasn't just well, don't go, just go be an accountant because there's lots of accountants and they do great work already. What are you going to do that's going to kind of be more rewarding? More what are you going to add? What are you going to be able to? do that's different than that. Um, so for me, that, that word calling, that synonym calling kind of speaks to me. Based on what you said about how you run your business and that you have your own podcast and why you have it, it might speak to you too. Yeah, I would say even more so than calling is like obsession and maybe even <laughs> addiction. I feel like those are good <laughs> synonyms that business people with small businesses will, will identify with. Uh, and I don't mean that in necessarily the negative sense of the word addiction, because, you, you know, usually addiction means you're, you can't really use that term unless your life's falling apart. That's kind of the nature of an addiction. But what I mean is just there comes a point where you cross a threshold and you can't ever go back when it comes to business. 
it's kind of like you know in the matrix i can't remember what color pill it is that neo chooses but once you choose that pill you can't you, you can't just go back and um in the e-myth michael gerber talks about it as having an entrepreneurial seizure that's not exactly the same as what i mean but but he talks about he, he talks about it from the you know we've all seen it a thousand times you have a technician and he's doing quite well and he starts to realize or she um i'm doing all the work and i know the revenue i'm generating i'm only getting a small piece of that i could start my own business and i'll get all of that uh -huh. and, and then he calls it the entrepreneurial seizure because it's like they can't the one track mind focuses on that and ignores everything else and they hang their shingle they start their own business and then one day they wake up in a nightmare because um it's a lot more complicated than just keeping all the revenue from the the technical work that you're doing of course but the thing is once you cross over to um owning a business to doing it for yourself for me the reason that i think you can't go back is because it's about creativity i think business owners are tend to be creative in nature i you know we talked about you know my music i know you're a musician as well yeah and uh i don't think i've ever seen you play with sheet music or if you do it's, <laughs> it's not a, very often there's a loose relationship to the music <laughs> that's true. on the sheet it's true. you're a creative type as well and um to me that's like the most kind of addictive slash rewarding and motivating aspect of the business is just what you were just talking about like how can you make it better it's that creative aspect of it and once you start engaging that creativity you can't be a slave to somebody else's ideas of what's the best way to do something. So, um, like for example, I, I articled at a, a great small firm out in rural Alberta called Patriot Law. A little shout out to Ed and Michelle Gallagher. They're fantastic people and were, and still are amazing mentors. And I still have a great relationship with them and I'm grateful for everything that they've done for me and continue to do for me in my career. Um, one, <laughs> I don't know what they were thinking, but like, you know, they, one of the reasons that they hired me was because they could see that the way that I think about business appealed to them. They think, they thought about, they think about their firm as a business and, and they have, they're innovative and they allowed me to come in brand new lawyer, know almost nothing about the law didn't even really have a ton of business experience at that point, a couple of businesses that failed, you know what I mean? And they, <laughs> but they were like, they listened to me. I had ideas and they, they didn't just, um, they didn't just like humor me. They listened and allowed me to implement real change in their business. And that was the only way it was ever going to work for me. And once I experienced that, I knew I couldn't just go work for somebody else because they wouldn't let me do that. They're not going to just let me come into their business and be like, yeah, you should do it this way. Let's do it th this is better. <laughs> they don't like to be told how to do things. Yeah. And, it, you know, I wasn't telling them how to do things. Uh, I was like, hey, what about this? And they, But they were just so meek and humble in nature that, like, they didn't care. They weren't, like, emotionally attached the way they did things. They did things for, a, like, they. it was very well thought out. They're both military as well. So okay. they're, they're very, they, they're good planners and everything they did had a purpose the reason like the way they did things had a purpose um but they weren't emotionally attached to that if there was a better way they wanted to do it a better way and so they were open to hearing ideas even from some guy who had no experience in the legal industry and so but that you know once once that happened you know i knew that that was it i couldn't because i thought about it so the, the reason i left patriot law was not by my choice I came back from Kuwait right after I came back, COVID hit. Uh, so I, I had been practicing again for about three months after being off for like nine months. Mm. And uh, it was in Onaway. It's a small little town. You know, you're familiar with Onaway. I Onaway. know Onaway well. Yeah, it's like 2,500 people. <laughs> and um, there wasn't, I wasn't busy. And so they couldn't justify paying me my salary if I wasn't generating enough revenue and COVID was coming and they were, they were worried about what was that going to mean. And so it was a very difficult decision for them, um, to let me go. But, uh, for me, it was like exciting. I didn't want to leave then I, because I was getting great mentorship 
and uh, I thought I needed more, still more, especially on the legal side of things, of the practice side of things. But business-wise, it, w- business it was exciting because I got to take what I learned from them and then see what I could do. Um, I don't know how we ended up here. <laughs> I guess the entrepreneurial seizure. Yeah, I was talking about how once there's a threshold you cross. And I've seen that with friends. I've seen that with lawyer friends. Um, They they get to a point where they they realize, um, it's probably like this for accountants too, but with with lawyers, there just comes a point where they realize, I can go out on my own and I don't have to work that hard and I can have a comfortable living. Maybe I won't be the richest, but I can be comfortable and do it the way I want to do it and I don't ever have to grow. I can just be a sole proprietor, just like on my own and and it'll be chill. And a lot of people do that. A lot of lawyers do that. And, and once they have that realization, they can't go to working for somebody else again. They just can't do it. I think it's that way across in general, right? Once you, once you cross that threshold from being just a technician to like thinking a little bit broader about creating something, you can't go to go back to not doing that. Well, I can tell you that I sometimes have had like nightmares about going back to try and apply for a job and work for somebody else someday. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't think I'd enjoy any aspect of that. Your creativity yeah. side is interesting. I never actually, I mean, I think I must have thought about that on some level, but I don't know if I ever really thought about it. I almost like feel like you're creating a, like your own child and you just like want to help that grow into something that you have influence over. Um, a lot of people listening to the podcast are people that maybe are considering starting a business. They're right at, maybe they're having that entrepreneurial seizure thing you're just talking about. <laughs> sure. Or they realize that they could do better on their own terms and whatnot than making money for somebody else, as it were. What, if someone approaches you or if they're listening to this podcast and trying to think, okay, well, I, I feel like I'm ready to make the leap, but, like, and maybe you, this is a hard question to answer, but what kind of advice or even just maybe things to consider would you invite that person to kind of stew over? Well, and this is something that I still kind of struggle with that, and I think it's important to recognize what you can do and what you shouldn't do and get somebody else to do the things that you shouldn't do or can't do or whatever. And that, that can be hard, right? So a lot of people start a business without talking to a lawyer or an accountant, as you know. Yes. And then we got to help them deal with the ramifications of that a couple of years down the line. But the reason they don't is because they don't have any money when they're starting a business. Like when I started my tiling business, I, didn't, I barely had two pennies to rub together. We, now, we got an accountant because we had to file our taxes. <laughs> but we never got a lawyer and we never set the company up legally, properly, the way that it should have been set up because we didn't know. Um So I'm sympathetic to why they would not get professional advisors right out of the gate. But um, if you're thinking about starting a business, I mean, you have to believe in it. You have to believe because you're committing to something and you're taking a risk and and it can be a big risk. Um, You're gonna, one of the biggest payments you're gonna make is time that you'll never be able to get back. And so you got to really believe it in your heart of hearts because it's it's hard. There's nothing really harder. And, you know, professional businesses are, are unique be, in a way because the overhead expenses related to the revenue generated are not like the... They're pretty low. Yeah, they're pretty low, right? You're, you're not paying, like, human resources is the biggest expense. Everyone has human human resource expenses, though. And, you know, you pay for an office space and you pay for your IT equipment and stuff. But in, at the end of the day, it's like the ratio between revenue generated and, and the cost of that revenue generation is is a good ratio. And so, and, and that's why there's so many accountants and lawyers that don't innovate. There's zero need to innovate. So we're in, we're in a lucky space where it's easy to kind of get along even if you're not good at business <laughs> um, because 
the product you're selling is generating so much revenue. But um, if you're not in that kind of business, you know, it's like, it's scary. And having been in businesses where, where, the, where it's a lot harder to generate that a revenue amount, like tiling at the time I was doing is like, you know, I think we charged like $450 for a kitchen backsplash. Now this was, you know, a number of years ago, yeah. but still like, that's like my hourly rate. <laughs> do that in an hour, <laughs> right? And, and that would take me all day doing that backsplash. And so margins are a little tighter. It's a little tougher to kind of get ahead and you got to work hard. So, and I don't, don't get me wrong. I don't think you have, I don't think um, there's a lot of trappings. There's a lot of pitfalls to being in a professional business as well. Um, so I, I don't think that uh businesses like ours are in a superior position to succeed than any other business. I don't think that's true. I, my point is just, it's going to be hard no matter what business you're trying to run. And so you have to really want to do it. Like you said, you got to believe in it. You have to, if you don't feel it in your gut, like if you're not all in, it's just, it's going to be too hard. So let's take that one step further. What if there's people listening that feel like they believe in themselves, but the chorus of well-meaning friends and family around them are saying, yeah, it's too risky or yeah, I don't think you thought this through or yeah, it's whatever. How do you navigate that? You can't listen to the haters. I mean, for sure, like I believe in mentorship. I believe in getting people's opinions, especially people that care about you, even though they don't have business experience or experience in the industry you're in. I, I, I still like, I still, I've, I think that's really important. Getting advice from people that care about you um, and and mentors, I think, is really important. That being said, um, that doesn't mean you have to follow their advice. Like your dad was like, well, I don't know about accounting. <laughs> but, you know, here you are, Mr. Chill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and you have measure of success. I, I think you're happier. I didn't know you back when you were no. uh, working for the man. But you're, I, you know... I think it's safe to say that you're happier. Like this, your business is an extension of your personality. You can see that when you walk in. Yeah, and for those that never will never make it here, you walk into our office and it's adorned with, like Evan was talking about an addiction to his business. My wife would say I have an addiction to Lego. And there's <laughs> like 35, 40 Lego sets with custom display cabinets. It's like that's a bit of an addiction. But yeah, you're right. Like the, the business is sort of an extension of you. And that's actually one of the things I love about being able to do this is being able to put your own personality into it. Like it's, yeah. It's, well, you're, you're, we're, we're all unique, right? Like we all have our own personality, background, et cetera, that we're bringing to this. You're going to build an accounting firm that very few, if any other person would build, no one would build it the same way. Right. And, and so, um, for me, honestly, making big decisions has always come down to not just like, I guess the foundation of my belief in myself and in my business also comes down to prayer. Yeah. For me, it, it like the decision even to go to university after my business failed, I wasn't planning on going to university. It really came down to thinking out a plan and then praying about it and getting an answer to my prayers that this was a good option for me it wasn't the case that it was like oh this is yes this is your destiny you have to go <laughs> but it was like and you know, at the time i was thinking i'd become a, a school teacher um but the answer i received was like yeah you thought about it do it this is a good idea and it turned out very different than what i initially thought but it, it definitely um is something that provided an anchor for me and anytime that i've used that process where i've thought about it and talked about it with my wife. Of course, she was an integral part of making these mm -hmm. decisions and prayed about it. I've received guidance and, and the result has been much better than I could have anticipated and often different than I anticipated at the time I made the decision. I, that's the level of conviction you have to have. You don't have to believe in God like I do. You don't have to share my faith, but you have to have that, that kind of conviction that, you know, 
this is, yeah, this is the right thing to do. And I'm not looking back. You know, when I've had those experiences, it's answered the question. Like, that's why I went to Kuwait. We had that same kind of experience where, okay, this is the right thing to do. And I'm not questioning it later. And for, for going to university and, and starting my own law firm, you know, it was all, once I had that answer, I knew I had confidence it was the right thing to do. I had faith it was the right thing to do in a way that I didn't need to answer that question again. The question was answered. And I think whatever way you get there, I think you kind of have to have that mentality. There's no plan B in a way, you know what I mean? You know, that, you ever seen the movie, I think it's it's one of the Dark Knight trilogy where they have, they depict Bane in this like pit and everybody tries to get out of this pit because there's no one stopping you, but it's nearly impossible to get out of the pit. Mm. And the the thing that re- everyone realizes at the end is whenever they try to get out of the pit with a fail safe, if they have a, a rope or a net or something they can fall just in case they fail, they can't do it. And only when he decides to try and get out of the pit with no safety net, no backup plan, do I'm doing dying. this or I'm dying, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> is he able to be successful in it? Well, I mean, if you just think about any success stories that you hear, I think in anything, it's always that same kind of idea, right? Like what was Steve Jobs or Bill Gates' failsafe? They didn't have a failsafe. No. You know, they didn't have a plan B. It was like, yeah, this is what we're doing, I guess. And you see that with successful athletes and musicians. And, and I think most successes in life, there's no like, yeah, I'm just doing this, but like, yeah, if it fails, then I'll go and do this. Now, I mean, I do have like uh, fail safes. Like I could always just go f- reg force in the military. Like that's an option that's available to me, but it's not one that I ever plan on exercising. I would not be very happy doing that. Yeah. You know, my experience in Kuwait taught me that. Um, being in that kind of an organization is not uh, is not something that I would really enjoy for the same reasons I'm, I'm I like solving problems and I'm creative and in the military you know that's very difficult to, to actually do to so and they have big problems and I can see solutions and uh, you're limited in your ability to affect the change in a big organization like that so yeah. So if someone feels like they believe in them, we've kind of talked about this, but let's just take it one step further. So if someone feels like they, this is what they're meant to do, they feel whether it's answers to prayer or just the universe or whatever they want to attribute it to, saying this is what you need to do, and they go at it, and they get partway into it, and at first they feel like, okay, I know this is what I'm supposed to do. I can, I can deal with the adversity as it comes. And the adversity keeps coming, they're like, hmm. Maybe I'm not supposed to do this. I've encountered a couple of bumps. Maybe this is not meant to be. How do you how do you recommend to someone that they don't abandon ship, so to speak, that they stay the course even when it gets hard? Yeah. Well, I'm not so fatalistic about it in that I I know like I can see, I can see like maybe the next step ahead, but I can't see what comes after that. So I don't know that I'm meant to have a successful law practice, for example. Um, I'm just doing my best and taking it one day at a time and, and, and I have a plan and I'm trying to fulfill that plan. But there could very well, something could happen where that's a catastro- catastrophic failure and, and I have to say, okay, well, that's it, I guess. And my, but that doesn't mean that it was, I, w- I shouldn't have done it um, because we talked already about learning from failures and, and you know, that's only going to improve me as a person. But that being said, um, for me, like, I think I'm like a lot of entrepreneurs in that I'm pretty self-motivated. Um, I think think you kind of have to be because just it's so daunting there's so many things that you have to deal with um in the past where i failed there'd come a point where like i just knew like yeah this is too overwhelming there's no way there's no way i can get out of this like it's over we're done (laughs) but um most of the time 
you know, I was also a lot younger and more inexperienced. And so those experiences and anyone who's starting a business can look back on their own lives and see their own experiences. Everyone has those failures and, and growth. So, um, I like, I guess my, my answer is, well, I don't know that they should keep going, but, um, it's okay if you fail, like that's okay. But uh, you also don't have to give up. I mean, it's uh, it's such a personal and and fact dependent uh, question. Like I don't, it's hard to say. But I get motivation. I think what I guess the question I, that I that I hear you asking really is like, so how can you find motivation when you're at a low point? Sure. Yeah. For me. Um, You know, again, mentorship, um, people that love me, people that care about me, like my wife is a, is a big motivator and she's a big, supports me in everything that I do. And so that's, you know, very important source of motivation. Um, and, you know, my faith as well. Those are kind of when things get really hard, those are the things that I turn to. No matter what it is, those are the those are the places I turn. Your so, family and your faith. Yeah. And other friends that are around, like good friends and extended family. You know, people that people that care about me, that are interested in me and and and, you know, willing to talk and share the burden of whatever difficulty you're going through. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I didn't know how personal or open you would want to get on this podcast, but uh, I think we've gotten a pretty neat insight into Evan as a person, <laughs> not just as a business lawyer. I had all these things that we could have talked about, all these like what if scenarios. I think we've kind of covered, I, I think I kind of want to end this on a um, similar note to where we are. Like the, there's, a, there's a good vibe in here. There's a, there's some good motivation for people that are trying to make that leap or just trying to decide what to do. I always take inspiration from other people too. I have three people I had kind of looked up. I don't know if there's any point of sharing all of them, but um, these are a couple of things that I found from people who, there's like this rags to riches concept of um, people who, like some people may run a successful business because it was already successful and they just got handed a well-oiled machine and just sure. continued on. And there's some people that maybe are starting from nothing and maybe even seeming like at a disadvantage and yet they turn it into something amazing and powerful. And I'm sure there's people that you've read about in books and biographies and like some of the more successful business people in history that you could probably fall back on who fit into this category. So I thought, well, wouldn't it be cool to look up just a couple of these and share some of them? Uh, for time's sake, I think I'll probably just mention one because I really like the quote um, that comes with it. Um, so I had looked up Oprah Winfrey. She's got a pretty amazing story. I think a lot of us are probably pretty familiar with it. Um, she actually talks about the spiritual energy side of things that you've kind of dived into. I looked up Sam Walton. People know him as the founder of Walmart. He's got a pretty cool story. Um, in fact, he's got a quote here that says, ignore the conventional wisdom. If everybody else is doing it one way, there's a good chance you can find your niche by going in exactly the opposite direction. <laughs> yeah, I think entrepreneurs tend to be contrarians in nature, I think. I mean, I know I am in a way. You know, it's like, oh, everyone's doing that way? Like, there has to be a better way. Um, you know, the good example being like, well, in law, uh, for a lot of things, it's the billable hour. And, you know, I, I didn't identify, like, I didn't know anything. I didn't identify this as a pitfall, but a Patriot Law, they're like, no, this is the worst. We're doing everything set fee. They, every, they do everything flat fee at Patriot Law. Mm -hmm. That's where I learned that concept. And, you know, they convinced me. So I'm thoroughly convinced <laughs> that the billable hour is the worst model ever. <laughs> and and I've had to use it, and I and I don't like it. I think it's not a great way to judge value for professional services. But um, yeah, I, uh, I like that quote. 
from Uncle Sam. <laughs> Different Uncle Sam than maybe people think. <laughs> but let me just highlight this story. And this one's interesting because I think most people don't even know who this is. They might recognize the company that he founded, but most people don't actually know who this is, which I think makes this even more interesting. So I'm probably going to butcher the name of this guy. His name is John Paul Deoria, I think is how you pronounce it. It's the founder of the hair care product line, Paul Mitchell. Okay. Okay. So people probably may be vaguely familiar with that. You go into a mm-hmm. salon and you can get some very fancy, expensive shampoo probably made by Paul Mitchell. This is cool. So it says he started his career as a truck driver, a janitor, and even sold Christmas cards door to door. He was actually fired from his first job in hair care. <laughs> Irony. Says in 1980, he formed John Paul Mitchell Systems with a loan of just $700, now worth about $3 billion and counting. This is an amazing quote. I just want to read a quote from him. And this might be a good place to kind of um, head to our conclusion. It says, the biggest hurdle is rejection. Any business you start, be ready for it. The difference between successful people and unsuccessful people is the successful people do all the things that unsuccessful people don't want to do. When 10 doors are slammed in your face, go to door number 11 enthusiastically with a smile on your face. Yeah, I like that. How does that resonate with you, Evan? Yeah, it's it's true. People, um, I, I think one of the things that I see in my business, the there's so much opportunity for innovation because it's it's really difficult to run a busy law practice like your own practice and deal with all your clients and um, innovate at the same time. It's very difficult. And even if you can have the idea like, oh, we should do it this way, implementing the, the innovation that you've thought of is very difficult. It, it takes it takes resources, especially brain power. It's a, yeah. so. In other words, it's a lot of work, and people aren't willing to put in the work. And there's not enough. And the reason they're not in the legal industry, at least, I I wouldn't be surprised is if it's the same in yours, is because there's not enough pain. They're doing well enough that it discourages the innovation. Because like, okay, I can innovate, and maybe that'll improve the bottom line a little bit. But I'm I'm already comfortable. I'm making enough money the way it is. So. Why should I change accounting programs to this other program? Because like this, there. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to talk about traction a little bit. One of the quotes that come from that book this is a book by Gino Wickman. Um, I know you're not familiar with it, so I'll, I'll I'll talk a little bit about it in a sec. But one of the quotes that he talks about is people are like a dog on a nail. He, he has a, he gives a scenario of this this dog sitting on a porch and he's moaning like whimpering, and the guy says, "What is?" what's wrong with your dog? And he says, well, he's sitting on a nail. He says, well, why doesn't he get up? It's like, well, because the nail's not causing him enough pain to move, <laughs> but it's still causing him pain. And, and people often in their businesses are like a dog sitting on a nail. I just, certainly am sitting on some nails that are not painful enough for me to like go and do something about it. And um, in the legal industry, Almost no nail is painful enough to do anything about it because the revenue coming in is high enough. Lawyers are in demand. It's hard to get a lawyer. And so, um, yeah. Um, Traction, I wanted to talk about it because you're talking about, you know, I guess talking about people who are thinking about starting a business. Traction is a great book. I look at it as as the, it's kind of like the child of seven habits in E-Myth. If they had a child, it would be Traction. (laughs) Traction, um, and he, Gina Wickman quotes a lot of others, D- um, Dale Carnegie and um, uh, Michael Gerber and Stephen Covey. He quotes he quotes all those books. But um, what he's really done is created this system called the Entrepreneurial Operating System, and it really is a framework. And the book is kind of like a step by step how-to guide of how to run a business. It, it provides an operating system. And it draws on principles from seven habits and it draws on the whole concept of, that Michael Gerber talks so passionately about of, of creating the franchise prototype for your business. And it just helps you provide, it provides a framework for doing it. And um, 
that's what I use as my operating system. We use that in, in our business and it's hugely advantageous. So it's called traction because there's there's two two parts to it, the operating system. There's the vision part and the traction part. So the vision part is, you know, in some ways the fun part because you're just thinking about like, oh, where do we want to go? Mm-hmm. What are our big goals? And then the traction part is, okay, how do you take that vision and bring it down to the ground level and get some traction so that you actually start to move towards that vision? So I, w- I, I highly recommend it to anybody who's running their own business. Um, even it, like, and I started using it when I was the only one in the business and I still got a lot of value out of it. It's even more valuable when you have other people in the business working with you. Um, it really provides a lot of good insight and direction onto, you know, how to run effective, successful meetings to keep things on track, how to keep the vision fresh in everyone's mind, how to refresh that vision quarterly. It's awesome. I love it. I, I use it all the time. So um, I highly recommend it to you and to anyone who's listening. I got it. My brother told me about it. My brother, uh, one of the brothers that I worked with in the financial planning business, he, he's, a, he's a great, um, he has a great creative mind as well applied to business. And he, uh, he's always got great ideas for me for books to read. In fact, there's a few that I have to <laughs> read that he's told me about that I haven't yet. <laughs> but it's just, just audible and I just listen to it while I'm driving. Yeah. And, or, or whatever. And, and, uh, and yeah. That's a great one. That I found more value from that one even than the other two than that we've talked about, Seven Habits and E-Myth. And both of those I, th- I find I was going to say, they're pretty valuable. important to you, so they are, yeah. you can only yeah. imagine. Tractions, I, I don't want to compare them because I really do see them as like, it's like the natural conclusion of applying the principles in Seven Habits to the principles in E-Myth. Then you get traction. Yeah. Well, we've talked about three books so far that you would highly recommend. One of them that I got to go check out now. Yeah. What One, do you What do you have? What are you, besides E Myth and Seven Habits? What's another book that you found invaluable in your business? Um, actually, two that I've gotten through lately that have kind of changed the way I think about things. Uh, one is uh, Simon Sinek's book Start with Why. Um, it's really kind of help me to evaluate what I do and more importantly why I do it and try to make sure that why funnels down through all the people in organization funnels down and all the different touch points we have with our clients and it like permeates through everything and more than just like a vision statement or ma- mission statement that kind of gives in a drawer or sits on a thing and people pretend is like important but isn't but this is like a really understanding the why um, another one that I think has really changed kind of the way I look at stuff as our firm has grown and we've got HR related things to deal with now mm-hmm. is Dare to Lead by Brene Brown. Um, she's got some tough language in there sometimes, so read it carefully, but um, some pretty powerful concepts in being a leader. And it doesn't have to be a leader in a big organization. It could be just be a leader in the, your community by starting a business. Um, but it kind of changed the way I look at stuff. And one of my favorite parts from her book was when she defined the concept of integrity. And uh, I don't remember the full definition, but basically it was a similar thing of, it's not just doing what's right, but it's integrity is kind of filtering into every area of your business and saying, does that reflect um, what you want to convey? Um, And then there's a TED talk that I've listened to probably seven times now by a restauranteur guy. I don't even, I don't know if this is one you've seen before. It's not very long, and it's like eight minutes. Um, to, I'm probably going to butcher this guy's name. His name is, I think it's Will Gidara, but he has been the owner of a five-star restaurant in New York called 11 Madison Park, and his TED Talk is called Unreasonable Hospitality. And the whole talk, and then apparently a book he's written about it since, follows this concept of this expensive five-star restaurant, and one of his most, mo- like, powerful moments in his business is when he ended up serving a $2 hot dog to someone that was from visiting from out of town who said the only part in New York they didn't get to experience they felt bad about is they didn't get to go to a ballpark and have a hot dog. And so he saw this as a moment to capitalize on that and he went out to the local street vendor and paid $2 for this probably terrible tasting hot dog. 
but it meant the world to that particular person that was visiting and it really helped him think about this concept of where else in my business can I provide what he calls unreasonable hospitality. Mm. And one of the things that stuck out to me about it being an accountant is he specifically said, you might think, well, that's easy to do in your restaurant. You know, what if you're in a professional business, what if you're a lawyer, an accountant or whatever? And I was like, Huh. <laughs> it's like, that, that is what I was thinking. <laughs> where could I apply that? Yeah. Right. So yeah. that's been kind of cool too to kind of see how we can like. Again, you said that there's not a, there's not enough pain in in some of these professional businesses to n want or need to make changes, right? But there's so much opportunity to do. That's so. what creates the opportunity. It's because they're not in pain, and so they just lazily plot along. I, I shouldn't say lazily. That's not really fair. <laughs> But, um, and it's, you know, it's kind of uh, <laughs> presumptuous, but, but it's just, they, they don't see the need to innovate because it's working. So why change? But, you know, one of the things I always think about um, when thinking about innovating in business is, I don't know if you remember in the early 2000s, were you already living in Canada in the early 2000s? I moved here in 2004. Yeah, okay. So right around that time, Quiznos came to Canada. Oh, okay. Before that, Subway had a death grip on Canada. And Quiznos blindsided them. They came in, like Subway was doing this V-cut notch out of the top of their subs, and they were the king. They beat out Mr. Sub, a little local Alberta uh, yeah. sub franchise. They were they They were killing it. Quiznos came in with their normal, you know, sliced buns, toasted in a toasting in an, in an oven, and just disrupted the subway industry, subway <laughs> sandwich industry in Canada. Um, and so I think about that. Like now, subway pivoted fairly quickly, and within a few years, uh, now Quiznos is almost gone. Yeah, They're, they've been choked out. And Subway has maintained their death grip. You know, any small town in Alberta has a Subway. Yeah. Like Burger Baron, a Chinese restaurant, <laughs> a curling rink, an ice rink, and a Subway. Maybe a Dairy Queen. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, I think so. I think about that, right? Like that being blindsided, and um, I think the the legal industry is ripe in Canada to be blindsided. I shouldn't, you know, I'm not an expert in the legal industry in Canada, but I'm very familiar with it in Alberta. And uh, I, I think it's pretty similar across the country. The U.S. is just a bigger market. So there's just, there's just so many more people, people like me innovating in the U.S. But in Canada, I just, there's just, I'm, I'm aware of a few in Alberta and uh, I try to know them so I can, you right. know, so we can, I can learn from them. They can learn from me and we can. Uh, you know, blindside the industry, but that's what it creates. It creates opportunity that 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 lack of pain. Um, now, for me, I don't. I'd like to know where your motivation comes for for innovating because it is difficult to do. But I can tell you, for me, it's you know, I started out later in life. I didn't, uh, you know, because I had that tiling business and I was in my family financial planning business, then tiling in that field, and then started university. And that was about 10 years after I had graduated from high school, whereas a lot of my um, schoolmates in law school were 10 years younger than me because they had just gone from high school to university to law school. So, and I already had, by the time I graduated from law school, I had five kids. So, yeah, I'm already thinking about, okay, how do I retire? And so uh, I just don't have the time that, uh, that younger people have. And so I'm hungry. I'm very motivated. Like, I... I I want to not be, you know, living on the street when I'm 70. Uh, I want to be prepared for that time. I want to be comfortable, of course, as well. I don't want to just survive. I want to be uh, create a comfortable life for myself and my family. So, I'm, I'm, I approach this this whole business and this industry as like with a with a hunger of wanting to create something better. Um, and that's part of the motivation. It's not just creating something better, although that is very rewarding and motivating to me. It's also like, you know, and I, ne I need to provide for myself and my family. Yeah. Well, you asked me the question, what, what's my motivation to innovate? I think that maybe three things come to mind. 
This one might sound strange, but I like being able to give people meaningful work. So like we have a payroll now way bigger than we've ever had before. And in some cases it terrifies me every time I go to like make payroll. I'm like, okay, it's up to a pretty good amount now. Mm -hmm. There's like a lot of people that kind of depend on this business being okay because it's now their livelihoods too. Mm -hmm. But I love being able to give people meaningful work. Um, so if that's a place that I can create a place where they can do that, that's kind of thing. And the more people I could give meaningful, rewarding work to, the better. Second thing comes to mind is I feel like almost like it's a challenge accepted moment for me to take an industry that typically is seen as being very boring, um, sometimes even un like less than fun, and finding a way to make it an enjoyable experience. And I, on our old vocation, I used to have a quote on my wall by Walt Disney that said something like, do what you do so well that people will want to see it again and bring their friends. And I used to think to myself, well, that's easy to do if you run an amusement park. <laughs> It's a little bit harder to do when you offer accounting services. What could I do that I could do it so well that people would want to come again and bring their friends? But that's sort of like been like a challenge accepted moment for me. How can I do accounting and tax? How can I offer these professional services in such a manner and experience is such a ex thing that people will want to come back mm -hmm. and bring people with them? So, and then the third thing comes to mind and it's part of why we have a like a logo. I, I don't know, like we have a mascot, uh, a penguin mascot that has nothing to do with accounting whatsoever, but I kind of wanted to build something that was bigger than me. So to do that, I know that I got to innovate. I can't just be relying on billing by the hour. I can't be limited by just on my time. I can't be limited based on like common thinking of how we do stuff. I have to kind of figure out how to do stuff bigger and better because I want to build something that's going to be bigger and outlast me. Mm. So for me, those are kind of my motivations. Nice, I get it. But it goes back to that creativity thing that you said at the mm -hmm. beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think about that as well. Like uh, I think people don't realize this about lawyers, but um, they don't make as much money as people think they do. Um, I think a few years ago I saw numbers for Alberta, the average income for a lawyer in Alberta was around $95,000 a year. Really? Yeah. There's plenty that make a lot a lot more than that. So that gives you an idea that there's plenty that make a lot less than that too. <laughs> there's lawyers making fifty, sixty thousand $60,000 a year in rural parts of Alberta for sure. And maybe even some in the bigger cities. 90% of the lawyers live in Calgary and Edmonton in Alberta, which are, you know, the two big profit, um, two big population centers. Um, between the two of them, like there's 4 million people in Alberta, 2 million live in Calgary and Edmonton, approximately. Yeah. So half the population is serviced by 90% of the lawyers. Um, and so, I mean, part of what I want to provide as well, that excites me is the same, same thing as you, is creating, creating a business that provides greater value to the clients um, and makes lawyers more money. Like getting both of those right, not just making more money off of the clients, but providing greater value to the clients than they can get a, a elsewhere. And at the same time, making it like turnkey for a lawyer to come in, get plugged in, and be making good money. That's that e-myth kicking into you again. So, Evan, um, we, as we come to a close of the podcast today, I want to thank you for your um, participation. I um, want to thank you for being here. I think you've offered some pretty amazing, valuable insight. Would you have any final parting words or thoughts to leave with people as we end? Uh, I, no, not particularly, just... You know, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. I don't know why you thought of me, but um, it was very, uh, you know, easy for me having, you know, appeared on over 50 episodes of my own podcast. <laughs> so I was happy to do it. Um, and uh, I was happy to hear that you're doing a podcast. Um, and we're supposed to be going for lunch. Yeah. It's been like two years since we did lunch, <laughs> I think. Seems like it. 
<laughs> but uh, no, thanks a lot for having me on. I appreciate it and, and letting me let me talk because on my podcast, we I don't. Maybe my listeners will disagree, but I don't often have a chance just to talk about myself. Right? Usually, we're, we're I'm talking about a specific topic, or we have somebody on, and we're digging into that person. Um, so it, you know, it's appreciate you know, being the one answering the questions for a change. And it was, <laughs> it was fun. I, I, I enjoyed it. And I'm happy to come back on anytime you want. Well, thank you. And you mentioned at the beginning, you weren't sure, 100% sure what your website uh, for your podcast was. <laughs> That's right. I think I wrote it down. It's a2jpodcast.com. There you go, .com. And w- of course, we have to have you, uh, we have to have you on as well. Yeah, well, they want an accountant talking about business, a lot of stuff. Well, we've had, uh, you won't be the first accountant we've had on. <laughs> so, yeah, for sure. We will have you come on um, because I know you I know you are innovative in the way that you do things. And so it'd be great to to that's right up our alley. So we'd love to have you on. Wonderful. Well, thank you guys very much for tuning in. Again, I want to thank Evan for being here with me today. Uh, I've had a lot of fun. I learned a lot and uh, kind of been re inspired on my end. And so I hope you have felt inspired on your end again. If you are running a business, if you're about to run a business, if you're thinking about it, or maybe if someone else doesn't trust you to run theirs, um, we hope that you find the inspiration and ideas and tools and resources you're looking for to be successful. This is uh, Mr. Chill and Evan Clark. Have a good day. You've been listening to the Business Speak podcast featuring Mr. Chill. Be sure to subscribe and add us to your podcast library to ensure you never miss an episode. We love hearing from our listeners. If you have a topic or question you'd like us to discuss, would like to be a guest on our show, or would otherwise like to get in touch with us, please visit our website at businessspeak.ca. Thanks for listening to Business Speak, the language of business simplified simplified